hey there. Welcome. Hop on into our hot oven time machine. The podcast where we dive into the history of baking and try out recipes past and present. My name is Joseph, a master amateur baker. And I'm Monty, a master baker in training. How are you today? I'm good. I'm cold. Yeah, a little, little chilly. It's uh, January now. You'll probably be hearing this in March-ish. But, you know, it's yeah, been a little chilly. Well, I mean, I say chilly. Uh, on January 1st, the high was 70, so... Yeah. That's Tennessee for you. And, like, literally in November, it snowed one day. Quote, snowed. snowed. <laughs> the, the southern version of snow. It flurried. How are you? I'm good. I'm jazzed. I'm psyched. Ready to rock and roll. Well, that's good. Me too. Well, uh, we've, we've got a little bit of follow-up from the last episode. Oh, we're doing that now? Yeah, yeah, we're doing that now. Okay. We're, we're hopping straight okay. into it. Oh, okay. Before we get into this week's topic. We've got a cover ground that was unfinished from last week. Mm-hmm. The flavor profile of the Tootsie Roll. I believe your position was that it did not contain orange flavoring. Yes. Am I correct in that assumption? Yeah, 100%. I don't taste orange. You don't taste orange. No. At least from the last time I recall eating a, a Tootsie Roll. Well, we were doing some research, and I, and I believe it was Monty herself who found the uh, piece of evidence that destroyed her stance. Paula Dean did me dirty, okay? <laughs> she wasn't the only one. It was someone else, too. But there were several other recipes that we several? found. Several? There were only two. I only found two, okay? Only two. Okay, maybe I was playing up a bit. All right, we found two recipes, but one of them being Paula Dean's. That counts as several worth, I think. Of yeah. regular recipes. Like, she's she's a baker, you know? Yeah, like, if, if you can't trust Paula Deen, then who can you trust? A lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not just going to go off of, uh, according to recipes here. We've we've gone out and, and got the dang things. Yeah, we got Tootsie Rolls. Gotta get mine. I put mine in my pocket to warm it up a little. That's the wrapper. We went and got ourselves original Tootsie Rolls, and we are going to do... You you get a double treat this episode. We're doing two taste tests. We are. All right. Don't want to go too much into it, because we may cover this one day as a separate thing, but it's a... Well, uh, I really forget, like, like, the texture. (laughs) It's somewhere between a, uh, a chocolate and a caramel. Yeah. It's, like, not quite one or the other. I was just, like, squishing them flat. (laughs) I just take a bite out of it. No, I play with my food. All right, well, cheers. cheers. Admittedly, it's been several weeks since we recorded the last episode, but in my mind, this tastes exactly the same as the orange flavored uh, no confection that we made. Uh-uh. No, no. To me, it tastes exactly the same. It just tastes like chocolate. You don't taste the orange. Like it's not overpowering, but it's like a hint. Mm-mm. Huh. Interesting. Well, it just it like. Hit me for like 0.2 seconds, but it really... I taste the chocolate more than the orange. You do admit, you did taste the orange. Could that be a placebo effect? Even if it was only for a ghost of a second. Do you think uh, placebo effects count in food? I what mean... you taste? Potentially. I don't know, to me it's clear as day. Like, you know, it's not overpoweringly orange, but like, there's a strong hint of orange underneath the chocolate. To me, this tastes exactly the same as that candy you made. If I suck on it, <laughs> we're just chewing. It's, it just doesn't taste like the confection to me. The confection was, like, overpoweringly orange. Well, and I think that was also... Wait, was it the orange or the strawberry that we put way too much extract in? Orange. <laughs> okay, the longer it's in my mouth, I kind of... It tastes like powdered chocolate, like powdered milk. I mean, yeah, that's kind of the... Did a little bit of research into it, like it's... There's definitely uh, powdered chocolate involved. I don't know if it's cocoa or some other combinations of things to make it chocolatey. Yeah, and also in the homemade recipes I looked at, you'd have to use powdered milk. But I'm going to count Paula Deen having orange extract, and for me, it tastes, from what I can recall from three weeks ago, to me it tastes exactly the same. So, ha hoisted by your own petard. I just, no, I refuse. <laughs> no, I... I you really refuse to concede? I really don't taste it. I just taste like the powdered milk. I can taste it. 
Okay. I guess we'll have to leave it up to our fans. Uh, hit us up. Let us know when you eat a Tootsie Roll. Might do like a Do you taste the something? orange? <laughs> yeah. Well, there we have it. Uh, we're still pretty firmly, I, I think, the, the candy tasted like a Tootsie Roll and I taste orange. And uh, Monty is still in the camp of doesn't taste the orange. So just let yeah, us know what you think. Tastes like a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, now that we've got that little bit of follow-up taken care of, how's about we uh, mosey on down to... Uh, pretzel Town. Our, yeah, Pretzel Town. We're going we're gonna to hop in our oven here and travel through time and across the world. For pretzels. To learn about pretzels. Are you ready, Monty? Yes. Let's do it. I'm strapped in. I'm still logistically trying to figure out how uh, a hot oven time machine works, like... It's an oven that's large enough for one to walk into, but when you get into it, it's it's a time machine. Oh, and it's, like, a lot bigger on the inside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like that. There we go. Could you imagine seeing, like, hunched over in, like, in an oven <laughs> and then, like, driving it like a car? I mean, like, even if it was an industrial-sized oven, it'd be pretty cramped. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking an oven that's uh, at least as tall as, like, the doorway to an industrial cooler. Yeah. And then you step in, and it's a wonderful time machine. That's what we're going with. Anywho. (laughs) The pretzel is a type of baked pastry made from dough that is commonly shaped into a knot. The word pretzel is derived from the dialectal German pronunciation bretzel, which is derived from the Latin bracellus or brachellus, which is a medieval term for bracelet, or brachiola, which uh, means little arms. Huh. It is the second Latin word from which several unreliable accounts of the origin of the pretzel stem from. Allegedly, pretzels were created by monks as rewards to children who learned their prayers. The shape of the pretzel is supposedly based on the shape of children crossing their arms while praying. That's odd. (laughs) I I think this might be one of those cases of sometimes, like, a history or a meaning was sort of reverse engineered from the shape. Because as the Latin word says, you know bracelet or, or little arms i can kind of you know see where they're getting that from like you could almost see if you had like a chain of pretzels sort of bracelet ish yeah so who knows this is one of those instances where the history isn't totally clear it's kind of just it's all hearsay yeah it's, it's been around so long that no one really remembers how or why it came about which happens sometimes in history well now i'm gonna be thinking about children when i eat pretzels now oh <laughs> Well, think about bracelets instead. (laughs) A more practical reason for the pretzel shape could be for transportation purposes. Much like the holes found in Finnish flatbread, which I was going to try to pronounce the word of the flatbread that they were talking about, but it was very complicated and I'm not good at Finnish. I'm sure if you look up Finnish flatbread, you'll, you'll find exactly what we're talking about here. But the Finnish flatbread has holes in it which allow the bread to be hung along a pole hanging just below the kitchen ceiling, sort of as a storage method. And bakers could hang pretzels on vertical stands with arms, or similarly like the finished bread. So it was was more, potentially more came about from just practical transportation and, you know, carrying it about reasons than Mm -hmm. necessarily the shape having any kind of meaning per se. Yeah. Uh, Though the origins of the pretzel has been lost to time, we can be sure it has existed at least since the 12th century of the Common Era, when the bakers of southern Germany and their guilds used the image of the pretzel as an emblem. Bet you didn't know that. No, I didn't. Now I'm like (laughs) trying to be like, okay, what is it? Pretzel making is still firmly rooted in the Franconia region and adjoining upper German speaking areas. Baked fresh every day, you can find pretzels in most bakeries in this region. They are often sold cut horizontally and buttered, or sold with slices of cold meat and cheese. These are referred to as butter bretzel. I did not know this, and that sounds amazing. So it kind of sounds like a sandwich made out of pretzel. Yeah. So apparently, uh, this fad that I've seen recently of, like, you know, pretzel crust or other pretzel buns and things of that nature, the Germans have been doing it for some time now. Wow, we really just steal everything, huh? Yeah, steal everything and make it worse. That's the American way. Oh, yeah. (laughs) One of the things I was most excited for about uh, when we had planned to go to Germany 
Ooh, trying some German pretzels. Yes. I was just excited to try all German pastries, actually, because oh. Dad was uh, going on and on about their croissants. The pastries, the chocolate, the oh. beer. Oh, yeah. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so excited, but... One day. One yeah, day. Yeah, we couldn't go, but... We'll go sometime. Yeah. I like how <laughs> I like how the thing I'm most excited for about going to another country is food. <laughs> Nothing else. I enjoy it for multiple reasons. I enjoy food. Uh, I enjoy landscapes and mm-hmm. nature. Yeah. I was just I enjoy some touristy city stuff. I'm not like I don't like the touristy trap kind of things, but you know, good touristy things. Yeah. I mean, those things are nice. I was just like food. <laughs> I want to try food. And just you're told you're going to Germany. Like, oh man, what all kind of food can I eat? Exactly. <laughs> you're, you're planning your whole trip around the meals. <laughs> yeah, I was actually like, okay, when we go to this place, I gotta see what food they got, and if we go to this place, gotta see what else they got. Right. And I know we were gonna go to like Christmas markets, and I was like, I'm gonna go like everywhere I can and see the different kind of food. I was hyped. One day. One day. Let's see. Where were we? Ah, uh, yes, the butter pretzel. Other popular toppings include sesame, poppy, sunflower, pumpkin, or caraway seeds, and also melted cheese and bacon bits. Pretzels can also be found made with different flours, such as whole wheat, rye, or spelt. So, like, that, they, they, they go buck wild for their pretzels. They do oh, just yeah. about everything with them. Uh, speaking of going buck wild for the pretzel, the pretzel is so loved in Germany that there are several festivals held for its celebration, the largest of which is the Bretzel Fest held in the city of Speyer. It is the largest beer festival in the Upper Rhine region, attracting usually around 300,000 visitors. Oh my god. The festival includes a parade featuring over 100 bands, floats, and clubs participating from around the entire region. That's my kind of festival right there. Yeah, as soon as I read that, I was like, I need to figure out when this festival happens. Oh, yeah. I want to go for that. Who cares about going to Germany for Christmas? Like, beer and pretzels? Sign me up. Yes, carbs <laughs> and carbs and carbs. Carbs all day, carbs all night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> carbs on carbs on carbs. Brush that sand, though. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that was about everything I could find. You know, I could have gone in further depth about uh, the pretzels in Germany, but as is so far as tradition in our podcast, uh, I like to do a general view of things. Mm -hmm. And that was my plan was to just keep it general, not make it American-centric. But there is a reason to explore the American-centric history of the pretzel, which we'll get to in just a moment. Hmm. Let me read on. Starting in the late 18th century, southern German and Swiss German immigrants introduced the pretzel to North America. These immigrants, commonly known as the Pennsylvania Dutch, helped to popularize and revolutionize the pretzel. While soft pretzels are still widely loved today, it was in 1861 that the Sturgis Bakery in Lilitz, Pennsylvania, became the first commercial hard pretzel bakery. Unlike soft pretzels, hard pretzels were more durable when kept in an airtight container which made them more marketable as a shippable nationwide food product. Which 1861, you know, just a little bit before uh, sort of the uh, Industrial Revolution and sort of nationalized mm-hmm. you know, shipping kind of things took hold. But like it kind of being, I had a hard time trying to find the exact, like were they the ones that invented the hard pretzel or had others dabbled in it and they were just the first commercial bakery? Yeah. Couldn't quite find out. But, you know, for them to have established that and then, you know, within a decade or two to be able to transport that nationwide, like, it was a really big stepping stone for Pennsylvania pretzel making. Yeah. Uh, To this day, Pennsylvania produces 80% of uh, the U.S.'s pretzels. The average Philadelphian today eats 12 times as many pretzels as the average American citizen. The average American citizen eats one and a half pounds of pretzel per year. So that means the average Philadelphia resident eats 12 pounds of pretzel per year. Can I move to Philadelphia? (laughs) (laughs) Oh no, Shiloh. Oh, Shiloh would be in trouble if she lived in Philadelphia. Ooh, yeah, okay, we can use this. Because also with the, the, the Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, pretzel making, there's a lot of candy making up in sort of the Pennsylvania area. Mm hmm. A lot of brew making. Uh, I've got some lightning round 
pretzel facts because I wasn't exactly sure how to put this in a more narrative form. Hey, so just, love it. Just some lightning round facts for you. Uh, in 1889, the Anderson Pretzel Factory in Lancaster, Pennsylvania was founded. Today it calls itself the world's largest pretzel factory, producing 65 tons of hard pretzels daily. Oh my god. In 1935, the Reading Pretzel Machinery Company in Reading, Pennsylvania introduced the first automatic hard pretzel twisting machine. Automatic hard pretzel twist. Oh. Yeah, some of the hard pretzels before they get baked and turn in, you know, they have a twist to them. I'm an idiot. (laughs) My brain. I immediately thought of twisting the pretzel while it's hard. <laughs> that's just going to break. <laughs> you know, uh, twisting pre-bake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in 1963, the largest soft pretzel of its time, weighing 40 pounds and measuring 5 feet across, is baked by Joseph Nacchio, or Nacchio of the Federal Pretzel Baking Company for the film It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Well, Joseph, I'm coming for your ass because I'm going to make a 41-pound pretzel. (laughs) Well, that was at the time. Uh, I'm not sure what the current champion holder of the weight. Yeah, you can look that up for us. Uh, You can have that ready by the time we we end our facts here. Uh, 1978, the first machine-produced stamped-cut soft pretzel was innovated at Federal Pretzel Baking Company, which was the same company that had made the world record-holding title that I just mentioned previously. Mm -hmm. Uh, In 1993, the first pretzel museum of soft pretzels is opened in Philadelphia. It has since closed, unfortunately. Mm. In uh, 2003, the Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell declared the 26th of April as National Pretzel Day, to acknowledge the importance of the pretzel to the state's history and economy. And I believe you have the current record holder for the world's largest pretzel. Okay, it was actually created by the brand Pilsner. Uh, it was, it, this is like just in 2015 though. But um, yeah, I, I can't beat this. It's uh, 1,728 pounds. Oh, oh boy. So, yeah, they're, they're really upped it, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I can hardly even just lift thirty pounds as a person. They they really uh they really went above and beyond there. Yeah. God, imagine the size of the oven. Oh, and uh, in Germany, they did one for Oktoberfest. Oh boy. It didn't like break any records or anything, but I mean, come on. Uh, how big was the one for Oktoberfest? It took me to Pinterest, so I don't know. Okay, well, that's for y'all to look up, I guess. <laughs> But uh, there we go. That's the uh, history of the pretzel uh, from Germany to America. Uh, soft pretzel, hard pretzel. Uh, I'm I'm partial to the soft pretzel. I like a yeah. hard pretzel every now and then. I mostly prefer them covered in chocolate. Chocolate, yes. If you're gonna go a hard pretzel, uh, otherwise I'm I'm definitely a soft pretzel all the way. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But uh, before we get into a sort of quick recipe overview and. Uh, you know, how the baking went, uh, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Pretzels. Why this bake this way? Oh, boy. Well, one of the most important parts about pretzel making, I feel like we should explain, I, I feel like it goes for the same with soft or hard pretzels, is that you, you boil them for about 30 seconds, and then, and then you bake them. So um, I looked up the Maillard reaction, it's so a very, it's a very confusing concept for me. But also when I was looking it up, the person whose article I read, it's so very confusing for scientists as well. Um, <laughs> okay, so you know, just I guess as long as we can get the the barest of understanding, then yeah, we're on the same level of the leading scientists of the Maillard reaction. Yes. The Maillard reaction is many small simultaneous chemical reactions that occur when proteins and sugars in and on your food are transformed by heat, producing new flavors, aromas, and colors. Oh, okay. It's it's also called the, the Browning reaction. See, I'm partial to that name because it has our last name in it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But Maillard also sounds pretty fun, so. But yeah, this one interesting part uh, is that it makes food more enticing to us. We've evolved to respond to two important signals when it comes to food, which is nutrition and general harmlessness, like when looking at it. 
Right, okay. So that's why seared steak looks more appealing to say if you were to boil steak, like who boils steak anyway, but it's going to be gray if you do that. Right, okay. If you, if you don't sear it properly, it's not as appealing. Like, yeah, it's still edible, but your your brain goes, ew. Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to be, like, salting that steak, drawing the moisture out so that by the time you put it on the heat, it sears it. And that's kind of how the Maillard reaction works. Oh, okay. You do it a lot in cooking, wherever you are. You can do it even with cookies. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess there's a bit of a Maillard reaction, say, on the bottom of a cookie. Yeah. Thinking even, even like in a cookie. Crust of the bread. Caramelization counts as a Maillard reaction. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's around more than I thought it was. Yeah. I was I was just associated it with like, you know, searing a steak or cooking meat. I didn't realize it was I mean, obviously pretzels I knew it was involved, but I didn't yeah. know it was even more widespread amongst baking. Yeah. Um uh, like essentially the protein bonds with the sugar during the process, which creates the browning. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a parenthesis. I, I couldn't read my own handwriting. I just put in parentheses with heat, moisture, and time, of course. And uh, different pH levels create, like, different browning and crispiness points. Uh-huh. So, like, when you, when I was boiling the pretzels, I had to put baking soda in the water. So it kind of, like, got this different brownness slash crispiness. Oh, okay. So that's why you only have to, like, boil it for... A certain amount of time. Like 30 seconds, yeah. or whatever you said. Sort of speeding up that reaction. Mm-hmm. That, way and the, then, that way the dough doesn't like get saturated with the water too much. Yeah, and then we throw it in the oven, that's when it... Oh, okay, and it's like, it's sort of prepping it for the Maillard reaction. Yeah, you kind of need a bit of moisture, I uh, Gotcha, I'm, okay. Yeah, assuming. Okay, gotcha. Um, I did want to read one of my favorite quotes from this article. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I either will link it. I, we might link it. Yes, yes. Uh, send me the link for it. I'll include it in the show notes so you can, uh, it, it, she was reading me a couple of excerpts here and there and it was a pretty wild sounding article. Yeah, it's, it's really good. The, the dude who wrote this, I'm just like, okay, I want to, I want to be like this guy. So it says, long story short, with the right amount of heat, moisture, and time, those specific sugars and proteins will act like a couple of lush drunk lovers, making out on the back of a Chevy, rapidly becoming a tangled hot mess, until nine months later, a whole new creation emerges. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I have to say that is a very descriptive and uh, inventive way of talking about a chemical reaction. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, after he's like, but, you know, uh, instead of nine months, it only takes a few minutes. And, you know, you're not having a baby. You're you're having food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very interesting read. Some of the explanations, I'm just kind of like, what? Because he's actually like a uh, like a scientist. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, so. we got a dual threat. We got a scientist here that knows how to write funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll link that in the notes. You can check it out. We didn't want to read it all verbatim. Just give that you a... one that just got me. <laughs> I loved it. All right. Well, now we know why pretzels bake this way. The yeah. Maillard reaction. So why don't you uh, give us just a quick little overview of the recipe and the and the baking process? And we'll of course put the recipe on our website so you can check it out. Mm-hmm. Follow along at home if you'd like. Maybe not follow along at home, because uh, we're not going to do it quite step by step or in the yeah. time that it would take, but <laughs> give you a quick overview. I was originally going to do sourdough pretzels. That would have been so delicious, but I understand uh, I know. <laughs> the extra hassle that sourdough entails. So <laughs> Yeah, either I'd have to do an overnight sourdough starter, which you can do, or I would have to start a... a starter from scratch and um we know what happened last time i did a starter so did we name that starter i don't remember if we did we still let it die after we named it we did name it i forget what we named it i think i floated the idea of naming it one of the cats so i wouldn't let it die (laughs) but uh didn't work no we named it jimothy didn't we because i always find jimothy to be really funny yeah i think we named it jimothy poor jimothy Poor, poor Jimothy. We'll just make a Jimothy Jr. But any hoozle. 
I mean, you're making bread, okay? So that's basically just water, sugar, salt, yeast, and flour. So just sort of your standard bread dough recipe. Yeah, and then melted butter. Oh, okay. And then you just kind of mix it until it's like really smooth and mm-hmm. like it, it stops sticking to the bowl. Okay, like the process for most doughs. Yeah, and then gotcha. you let it rest for like an hour or until it doubles in size. Okay. And then you roll it out, cut it, twist it, boil it, and then cook it. So when you boil it, and I know you mentioned this uh, a few minutes ago, uh, you add, was it baking soda or baking powder? It was baking soda. Baking soda, and that helped change the uh, pH level of the water? Yeah, because if you remember from episode one, baking soda is just the acid. Gotcha, yes, correct, okay. Yeah. Excellent. Good callback there. Yeah. No, baking soda is just the base. Duh. Well, uh... (laughs) Base. It changes the pH, still, but... Yeah, still changes the pH. It, it's the base, not an acid. Makes makes the water more basic. E- Just your basic white water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, now that we've got that quick little overview, uh, what you say we, we warm us up one here and uh, give her a taste of roux? Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you, Monty. Uh, we've decided to split a pretzel here today. Some of them came out a little bit larger than others. Uh, nothing wrong with that, though. Yeah. Like a nice, good pretzel. I would say this one's got a... It's, it's a little bit more done on the bottom than the top, but the top has a pretty decent... Oh, yeah, there you go. Here, I'll... Some nice, nice uh, sound there, thumping yeah. on it. It's got a nice crumb. Oh, yeah, it's got a nice soft crumb. The outside's got the... The, the right kind of texture to it, you know, just sort of that crispiness without being too crunchy. Mm-hmm. Other, other than the bottom, but uh, that's okay. I, I like a little bit of, we'll give it a little bit of uh, contrast. Mm-hmm. So, uh, cheers. I'm gonna cheers. Dig into this bad boy. Wow. That was so good. It's really funny. Every time I eat a homemade pretzel, I just go, yep, that's a pretzel. <laughs> Yeah, the saltiness, you put a perfect little spread of sea salt on top, so you just got this nice little pop of salt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's got the perfect, like, bready chewiness without being too chewy or too hard or too soft. It's You nailed it. Thank you. This is a great pretzel. And I, I see you've you drizzled the top with a little bit of butter along with the, uh, the salt. Uh, not on this one, no. But I did do an egg wash. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Now, is, uh... Are, are, are bagels sort of similarly boiled? Yeah. Like a pretzel? Okay. Yeah. It's like eating it, it I mean, it doesn't taste like a straight bagel, but mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm getting a bagel-ish flavor from it. Yeah. Also, the bottom has the flavor of a hard pretzel. I do like that. Mm-hmm. You don't really get that when you're like buying pretzels, you know? I'm sorry, say that again. You don't really get that when you're buying pretzels, like you know when oh, like you a like soft pretzel. Yeah, like when you go to Target or whatever, and they got that soft pretzel. Gotcha. Yeah, I do like that because I like the flavor of a hard pretzel, but I don't like the the mouth drying effect. Yeah. <laughs> of a dry pretzel, it, it really absorbs all the moisture in your mouth, makes you feel like you've been walking through the desert. Yeah. This is like a good combination. You can get that little hint of like the flavor of a. A hard pretzel, but it's overall the nice light and fluffiness of a, of a soft pretzel. Mm-hmm. I do enjoy that. It's a very nice... Some of them came out uh, different colors than others. Uh, this one, more on the light brown color, but that's okay. Kind of like them a little bit lighter. Mm-hmm. Got some that came out a little darker overall. Yeah, those are on the top. I didn't think about that. That's okay. I think overall, uh, I've never had a homemade pretzel. So for a homemade pretzel, uh, this is pretty good. I have to say, I actually enjoy this one more than the sourdough one I made, but probably didn't make the sourdough properly. I mean, even without being sourdough, I think something about the boiling process gives it that tanginess that you kind of get from a sourdough. Yeah. You know, it's maybe not as uh, powerful as a sourdough one would be, but it's, it's still got a certain tang to it that kind of is enjoyable. Yeah. All right. Excellent. I love bread. Oh yeah, me too. Bread is unfortunately my best friend. <laughs> I love bread so much. But now it has come time for us to rate. I'll rate first. Yeah, go for it. I'm going to give it a nine. 
Oh wow, really? Yeah, it's a it's. I've never had a homemade pretzel. It's. I mean, you know, sometimes bakery pretzels kind of cheat a bit because sometimes on bakeries they make them they make their products maybe not quite as healthy <laughs> for you as as they could be. They put more sugar and butter and salt. Uh, so for a homemade one, I don't think you went too overboard with any one ingredient. I think it tastes great. It's like kind of, in my mind, almost the absolute perfect pretzel. Again, leaving room for improvement. We're still in the first within the first ten episodes. Don't want to throw out a ten too fast and loose, you know. But I'd, I'd, I'd give this a nine. I, I enjoy it. It's a good pretzel. Uh, I was just gonna give it a seven. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're the baker, and if you feel it's a seven, then that's fair. Would you Would you like to elaborate on on why you've ranked? I mean, seven's not totally bad. Yeah. In school grading, that's a C. You're still passing. Yeah. <laughs> What 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 could use improvement? Definitely the color, the bottom, even on the lighter ones, browned way too much. Cause this is one of the lighter pretzels, and look how dark that got on the bottom. Yeah, it did get pretty. Uh, I would say that's nearly burnt. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of gives it almost this dryness. I mean, I guess in all honesty, that's probably what keeps it from being a perfect pretzel. But otherwise, you know, that's, that's just a slight execution error. Yeah. Overall, recipe and flavor-wise, I thought it was great. Yeah, I are, mean... Are, are there other things you wish were, were better about it, or is it just mainly the uh, the error in baking? I don't know. Maybe I have too high of standards, because <laughs> I just... When I eat pretzels, I just buy pretzels, like, at the mall. That's, like, my only, like, point of reference of a pretzel. Uh, okay, I gotcha. And those are so good. They are. We also didn't have any fun toppings. Yeah, I didn't want to... Could have, like, gotten cheese or cream cheese or... I mean, you can put just about anything on a pretzel. Yeah, the recipe that I used for this, they had a cheese... Like cheese dipping sauce? Yeah, but I wasn't going to make it. I thought it was a good pretzel. But... Yeah, it's good. I, I Not my f- absolute favorite, but not my, like, absolute... Not the worst pretzel yeah. you've ever eaten. I, I it's mean... still really good. Like, I'm still eating it. Yeah. <laughs> so, obviously, it's still a good pretzel. Yeah, so, obviously, it's still good. Like, you know, if it was bad, you would have taken one bite and been done with it yeah <laughs> so this is just it's a seven you know i mean hey fair enough you can't give them on like nines and eights i will have to look back and see what all my scores have been so far because i feel like i've been a little bit more generous in my score <laughs> <laughs> but also so far i'm not the one who's baked anything so i don't know if it's like a, a subconscious just trying to be nice to my sister and co-host don't be nice to me <laughs> i ain't down with that <laughs> shit <laughs> Maybe that was a little aggro, but... All right, there we have it. That is our review of Monty's pretzel. Yeah. Or bretzel, as the Germans would say. Uh, If you want to check out the recipe for that, and we'll have some photos posted on the website. You can also post some photos on Instagram if you're more of an Instagram person and just want to see what they look like and not necessarily care about the recipe. That, uh, That brings us to the end of today's episode. Thank you for making the pretzels. Thank you for eating them. Oh, you're welcome. Any, anytime, anywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I wanted to thank you for listening. If you enjoyed our podcast and would like to financially support us, please head on over to our Patreon. We have three different tiers for support, and we would uh, greatly appreciate it if you became one of our patrons. Uh, our three tiers, we have uh, our entry level for $5 a month. You become an official patron of our podcast. and gives you early access to episodes. You'll have access to an RSS feed that is just for patrons. You can upload that to your pod player of choice, and your episodes will show up a day or two early. Uh, Our next level is the Patron Plus for $10 a month. You'll get the early access to episodes, plus a shout-out on the show. And then our uh, VIP Patron for $15 a month. The previous two tiers worth of rewards, as well as a monthly Ask Us Anything series, uh... Shoot us your questions on the Patreon over the month, and we'll do a... We haven't quite decided if we'll do it live or just uh It will be a video, but yeah, yeah we'll do a video answer. And uh, we're also open to hearing from you guys. If you'd like different rewards or different tier levels, just let us know. Uh, we're open to changing things up. We, we just thought that was a good sort of place to start. If, uh, if no one's interested in m- monthly AMAs, we can figure out some other reward for that top one, you know. We're flexible. Yeah. We're you know we want to hear from you guys. I want to know what you're interested in, what you want from us. We you know we appreciate your support, and we just want to give you that little bit extra back. So thank you very much. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you're unable to donate financially, which is totally understandable, uh, if you just do us a small favor of uh, rating our podcast or sharing it with a friend, just as much you know, word of mouth we can get out to get more people interested helps us and then helps provide you with even more content from us which we're happy to make we want to make so just we we appreciate any help you can send our way and just thank you so much for listening yeah thank you a little little heads up for next week we'll be diving into the history of saint patrick's day we'll also be reviewing some uh saint patrick's day inspired drinks and treats yes we're gonna be getting a lit a little bit (laughs) tips a little drunk no, a little tipsy. Somewhere between tipsy and drunk. We'll we'll see. I always tell the line. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will see you next time and hope you have a great day. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye.